We're going to turn our attention this morning to Matthew 28, 19 through 20 quickly. And then again to Mark 16 and 15, the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark, the end of their gospels. Jesus has already resurrected. He's about to ascend into his heavenly and holy habitation. But before he does, in their presence or the presence of his disciples, he leaves them with instruction, entrusting his entire ministry, his entire purpose to be continued through them in the earth. In Matthew 28, Jesus speaking, he said, Go ye therefore, and the therefore was because he just reminded them that he has all power both in heaven and on earth. He said, So go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, he reminds us, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Mark 16 and 15, the same context, the same scriptural setting. He said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That was their charge, the continual purpose and the reason that he did not take them out of the world as he was departing. Preach the gospel to every creature. And I would like this morning to us as a church to speak, to preach, to minister from this subject today to all of us, including myself, the simple title, The Message, The Mission. The Message, The Mission. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. There are certain discoveries that have undoubtedly changed the world as you and I know it. Smallpox vaccine, for an example, that was discovered by the British doctor Edward Jenner. Smallpox for its day and time forever altered the course of the world. The discovery of DNA the team of Watson, Crick, Wilkins, and Franklin who did invaluable work in the 50s, where would we be today without the full understanding and discovery of DNA? Among those life-changing, course-altering events in the history of mankind would be Albert Einstein's The Theory of Relativity. There would also be the indispensable part of modern medicine with the discovery and the invention of x-rays. As you go down a long list, when you think about it, there are things that you and I now take for granted that, for have, that have forever altered the way that life has gone and the way we live it to this day. It was in 1928 that Dr. Alexander Fleming returned from a holiday to find mold growing on the side of a petri dish. He realized that the mold seemed to be preventing bacteria from growing around it. And so he soon identified the mold that was being produced, a self-defense chemical that could kill bacteria, and he named that substance penicillin. And before antibiotics, a relatively minor infection would prove incurable or even deadly. So everything from a paper cut to childbirth had the potential to kill human life through bacterial infection. But it was in 1941, the consequences of the scientific team, scientific, scientists or team of scientists when they realized that there was trouble in the production of penicillin and the shortage thereof, it became apparent with the first human trial of penicillin. His name was Albert Alexander, a 43-year-old policeman that had developed a life-threatening infection from a cut, a simple cut. He initially showed signs of recovery, but because the supply of penicillin was quickly running out, 
Albert's infection returned and died five days later. Could you imagine with me today what our world would look like without penicillin or antibiotics? Many of you perhaps are even taking some this morning or perhaps throughout the week. A simple little element or discovery like that changed the outcome of the world and affected its population forever. What about the efforts, however, of Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Edison? What would our world look like today without the discovery of electricity? Or what about Orville and Wilbur Wright on that infamous day in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina in 1903? Can you and I sitting here this morning imagine a world without airplanes and travel by air? Or what about Charles Babbage, who many consider to be the father of the computer? Or Bill Gates and Paul Allen, who created high-quality products and operating systems that computer companies could use? What would our world look like today without computers? What about the two Steves, both Wozniak and Jobs, founders of Apple and inventors of the iPhone? What would our world, young people, what would your world look like today without smartphones and smart technology? When you look back at the Chronicles, the bio biographies of Steve Jobs, it is recorded and noted that his vision for Apple was a company, listen to this, that turned powerful technology into tools that were easy to use and tools that would help people realize their dreams and change the world for the better. Apple's current CEO, Tim Cook, said it like this, Our products do amazing things, and just as Steve envisioned, they empower people all over the world. What would our world look like today without the invention or the discovery or the founding of Apple? These men and countless others throughout the centuries they believed in their discoveries. They worked hard. They believed that their discoveries, in fact, did work. That they would change lives and change the course of history. They believed that what they had discovered and what they had founded possessed the power to improve, to heal, to alter, to further and forever change the world for the better. Yet humbly and soberly, I ask this morning, do we believe the same regarding the message, our message, our apostolic New Testament message of salvation? If medicines and electricity and aviation and computers and technology, if the discoveries and inventions of mankind have the ability to forever impact and reshape the course and the trajectory of civilization, I ask us this morning as a church, as a people of God, what about that sovereignly authored and divinely inspired narrative become reality? What about that? What about the message of God manifest in the flesh and dwelling among men? What about the human embodiment of the Godhead? What about the coming of the man, Christ Jesus? What about the story of a resurrected Savior, the first fruits of all them that ever slept? I ask you this morning, what about the declaration and the founding of the gospel of the the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. What about the message? The most meaningful, profound message, however you want to categorize it, discovery ever proclaimed among mankind in the entire history of of the world, that message that is still being echoed through the most powerful entity on planet earth, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. What about that message? I know we often don't think about it, but do you understand that right now the only thing that is fending off the absolute and full fury of the Antichrist on 
on planet earth is the church, is you and me, the body of Christ. We are the only thing, the only entity, the living organism that is keeping back the full fury of Antichrist in the earth. Little old you and little old me being a part of the body of Christ. And I, I, want, I, want, us, I want us to have a, 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 a reminder this morning, a, a, a renewed passion, if you will, about, about this message. Because what we understand is that there is no other message, no other message found in the New Testament, no other plan of salvation than the message that we have been entrusted with on this earth for the season and through the serving and fulfilling of our lifetimes. It was so absolutely positive, or so absolutely positive, was the Apostle Paul about the gospel that he was entrusted to preach to the Gentiles. That I want you to listen to how impassionate, how passionate he was, and how confident he was in the words that he penned to the church of Galatia. This is what Paul said. He said, though we, he said, if I come back to you, and I'm preaching a different gospel. If I change my, my, my message, if I change the tone, if I, if I come from a different angle, he said, whether it be we, the apostles, or an angel from heaven, if we come preaching any other gospel other than the one that we have already preached to you, he said, let him be accursed. The direst kind of, 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 of disconnection, the absolute, the, the, and, uh, it just, just, just the, the, I can't even think of the word that's in my mind, just let them be accursed. He said, as we said before, so say I now again, that if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, Paul said, let him be accursed. And Paul is literally, he is putting himself in that very category. Paul would go on to say to the church of Galatia, he said, I certify to you that the gospel that I am preaching, he said, is not after man. In fact, he would give further explanation and let them understand that he did not receive it from man. No one taught him this. He said, neither was I taught it by man. He said, but what I am preaching, the message that I have been preaching to you came by revelation of Jesus Christ. He said, I did not confer immediately with flesh and blood, nor did I go and check it out with the other apostles who were apostles before me because they had already preceded Paul in the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God. But he said for three years, he said, I was preaching this gospel that Christ himself revealed to me. He said, but after three years, I did go and I visited with Peter in Jerusalem. In fact, I spent 15 days with him. And then I found out that I was preaching the gospel that Peter and James and John were preaching to the Jews. And so a span of 14 more years would elapse as Paul would go out into his world and preach on his missionary journeys the gospel again that Christ revealed to him and then after 14 years I, I can only imagine that Paul was wanting to make sure let me let me just be sure because he was so radically transformed in his conversion experience that he he wanted to make sure with everything in him that he was still hitting the target and he was on course so after 14 years he went up by revelation and the Bible says that he communicated to them the gospel to the other apostles, making sure that what he was preaching to the Gentiles was in alignment. He said, I went to them privately that were of reputation, the pillars of the church in Jerusalem. He said, because lest by any means I should be running with this message or had run thus far in vain. So important if Paul was able to declare such a devastating consequence so boldly and confidently, including himself in such a fatal category or condition of being accursed. I ask us this morning, rhetorically, what then was the gospel? 
He said, I made sure that the gospel that I was preaching was the right gospel. And if I come preaching to you any other gospel, then let me myself be accursed. The gospel, brothers and sisters, very simply is good news. But it's so much more expansive than just good news. It's far more comprehensive than just a, a Christian cliche or catchphrase. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he would declare again to the Corinthians uh, the gospel that he had preached to them and that they themselves had received and were standing in. Are we standing in the gospel that we have received this morning? That is a question we must all ask ourselves because Paul would go on to say to them, the gospel by which you are also saved. We are saved by the message of the gospel. But there is a condition, he said, only if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. In other words, I don't want you to forget it. It's not a one-time thing, but this message, are you standing in it after having received it unless your belief had been in vain? And this was the gospel that Paul preached. He said, first of all, I declared and delivered to you that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. We must all understand that the world was lost and dying. The world was out ho without hope. And you and I were in that world. We too were without hope and without mercy and without God in our world and in this life prior to receiving the message of the gospel. Christ died for our sins. You talk about a remedy. You talk about a discovery. You talk about a revelation that would forever change the course of the world. Do we realize today that no matter how advanced they tried it, they built the Tower of Babel. No matter how advanced, no matter how inventive and creative humanity could ever have become, it did not possess the power to alter its own course. It was doomed for a devil's hell without the interruption and without the unfolding of the plan of God in our lives, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. That then Paul said he was buried. That is uh, the part of the gospel he wanted them to understand. This is the gospel. He was buried. Christ was buried and then he rose again the third day. Again reiterating according to the scriptures. So what I want to ask us today, do we believe, do every one of us truly believe that what we have received when applied to our lives saves us? And not only does it save us, do we believe that the gospel still works in the world in which you and I are living? Come on, do you believe that this morning? I don't know. That's up to every one of us to answer. I'm just declaring unto you the gospel. Are we still standing firm on the faith foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ himself being that chief cornerstone, that gospel. I love in Ephesians, Paul said to them, you trusted in Jesus Christ. You believed the gospel. He said, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Paul said, you believed it. And he said to them, you knew that it was the gospel of your salvation. Where was it that Paul would preach for the very first time the gospel to the church of Ephesus? We would find that without going there right now in Acts chapter 19 verses 1 through 6 when he met the initial 12 disciples of John Baptist in Ephesus in its upper coast. And so he would remind them years later, do you still believe the word of salvation, the gospel of truth? Do you still believe it? Hallelujah. Paul would go on to say, as he would dive deeper in dealing with the church at Rome, he would tell them, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed that Christ died for my sins, that Christ was buried, that Christ rose again. Why was Paul so unashamed? Why was he so definite and so sure about the fact that he was running with truth and the message of salvation? He said, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth through the suffering 
and the sacrifice of the cross and the resurrection of the grave. Now here, here is something that is startling that we need to perk up and pay close attention to. And again, I'm reiterating, and I want it to be very clear to us, that all throughout the scriptures, in the New Testament, after the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the very message he commanded his disciples to preach unto all the world, it never changed. It was forever the same message, the one and only gospel. Now watch, Peter, in his first book, he would ask a startling and a provoking question to his audience. He said, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? He was posing this to them in contrast to their salvation experience and saying to them, what shall be the end of those that do not obey this good news, this gospel message? Paul, in like kind, would warn the church of Thessalonica the, uh, that, that the Lord Jesus, when that day comes and he is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, Paul said he is going to come and watch. He is going to take vengeance on them that know not God, and that word know is not intellectual knowledge or intellectual acceptance. That word know is intimacy. Those that know not God, they're not intimate with Him, and watch, and they know not or have obeyed not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so an honest reader cannot get into the scripture and not see that there is a consequence of not obeying the gospel versus the benefits and the blessing of salvation in obeying the gospel. Now that word to obey, it simply is to apply, applying the gospel to one's life. It means to act upon the message that has been proclaimed and to do what has been preached in order to bring about the intended result of the gospel. If God had to manifest in the flesh because the world was plunging into an eternity of darkness and an, uh, an unending abyss of torment, then I think it's pretty noteworthy and important to understand that we need the gospel and that what God did in, in terms of, of being our Savior, it, it, must, it must be worth looking into. So how do we obey? How do we obey the gospel? How do we obey the God? We don't obey the gospel with a hand clap. We don't obey the gospel with an amen. We don't obey the gospel with a verbal confirmation. How do you and I, the believer, the sinner on his way and on her way to an eternity lost and separated from God, how do I obey the gospel? If the gospel is that Christ died, then I can only deduce that I must die. Not going by way of this earth, but by dying out, if you will, to my old self. Dying out to my nature that was wild from the womb. Dying out to the life that I had been living in the world apart from Christ. Apart and away from the mercy of God and the goodness of God. If Christ was buried, then I understand that I too must be buried as Christ was buried. Buried in a mausoleum? No. Buried in a tomb? No. Roll, a, roll away a rock and hide myself in a cave? No. But if Christ Christ was buried, I too must be buried. If Christ rose again, then we must understand that it is imperative according to the gospel that Paul and Peter and the others were preaching that you and I must too rise again. So how do we obey the gospel? I remind a very intelligent audience and I provoke others that might not yet have fully obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. First, we die through repentance. We die through repentance. Repentance is not merely an I'm sorry. Repentance is literally, it is a verbal confession, but more than that, it is a radical change of behavior. We understand through the word of God that if we're really repentant, then there's going to be fruit. There's going to be evidence. There's going to be proof. Bringing forth, the Bible says, works that are meet or adequate for repentance. I think of, of, of Peter. 
Peter and I think of Judas. I, I think there, there, there was, was Judas who betrayed his Savior, his Master, the Messiah. There he was. And he was so condemned by what he did. But his heart was so hardened that he could never find an altar. He could never bring himself. Hear this. He could never bring himself to literally confess what he had done in betraying the God that came to save him. He couldn't do it. But there was Peter. He felt the condemnation. He felt the conviction. The pricking of his heart because he denied him. And there he was, Jesus, hanging on a cross. There he was, suspended Jesus Christ on a cross. And when Peter saw the glance of those loving eyes, he literally fell upon the rock and he went and wept and repented of his sins and never looked and never turned back. It was Jesus that would say, except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. So repentance is so critical to the salvation message and experience. We are buried with Christ. How can we be buried? We are buried with Christ in water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, that makes no sense. How can I be buried with Christ? He died on a cross and rose again some 2,000 years ago. How do I do that today like Christ did that back in the Bible? Well, Romans chapter 6 lets you and I know that as many of us that are baptized into Jesus Christ we are in fact baptized into his death therefore the Bible says that we are buried with him by baptism into his death so you and I can obey Christ dying for our sins by dying to ourselves we can be buried with Christ when we are baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we are filled with the resurrection power to rise in this life, not only in the life to come, but to rise up in this life above the power of sin and bondage. You and I are given an overcoming power of resurrection when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Paul would tell us in Romans that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so you and me should walk in newness of life. And not only in this life, but again one day to be able to meet the Lord in the air when the trump of God sounds and hear me church the trump of God is going to sound I know it seems like a long time I know it may seem like a fairy tale to some that that day is never going to arise arrive but I'm telling you right now that there is going to be a day that our ears are going to pick up on a frequency we have yet to hear and we're going to know what in the world was that and when you and I look up we're going to see our salvation drawing nigh hallelujah I'm here to tell you it's not an accessory I'm here to tell you it's not a little extra special gift it's not land yet it's not a bonus it's not a surprise in the package I'm here to tell you it is essential that we obey the gospel including the baptism of the Holy Ghost Hallelujah. I'll prove it to you in Scripture. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. This is what the Bible says. That if we do not have the Spirit of God, then we are none of His. We are not a part of Christ if we are apart from having the Spirit of Christ living in us. And we'll have nothing in us to get us off this earth to empower us to meet the Lord in the air when He descends on the clouds. Verse 11 of Romans 8. But if, notice it's conditional, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, if that spirit dwells in you, so I want to make sure that spirit dwells in me, if he that raised up Christ from the dead, if it's in me, shall also quicken my mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in in you. I'm telling you when that trumpet sounds if the vessel doesn't have oil it's not going to have liftoff and I want to make sure that no matter what it is
is the first thing leaving this earth. I want out, and I want to make sure that I'm full of oil. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, what is it? Why? Why? What was it? What is it? What is it? This is what Hebrews 9 and 22 tells us. That almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. We understand, I trust this morning, in this day in which we live by now, as Christians, that we cannot enter heaven in sin. Sin will not be a part of that eternal life and landscape. And so we know that there is only one ingredient, only one liquid currency that has the power to keep us out of eternal damnation and place us in the kingdom of God. It is blood. That is why God manifests in the flesh. That is why the Bible reminds us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. It is the only thing that remits the sin from mankind. Now, this was not going to come from a Petri dish. This was not going to come through the discovery or the marvel of modern medicine. No, no. This sinless blood required to purge away the iniquity of humanity, forever changing the course and the population of eternity and this world was only possible only possible through the manifestation of a divine miracle that is God incarnate it is the only way that is why the God of heaven the creator of heaven and earth that is why he prepared a body for himself That is why he overshadowed a virgin by the name of Mary. Because he needed that body that would be produced in the womb. He needed the blood that would be sired from the father's overshadowing. He needed that sinless and immaculate conception to take place for the salvation of you and I. And this is too important to make sure that we have not yet applied and obeyed the gospel to our lives. John the Baptist, he led with it. He was that voice crying in the wilderness, making way for the Lord. And this is what was said of John the Baptist and his mission. This was his message, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. There was no knowledge of salvation apart from remission through the tender mercy of our God. We must understand it is not to draw a line of right or wrong. It is not to draw a line to determine preeminence. It is not to draw a line to to solve and settle religious battles. We must understand that it is the tender mercy of God that is reaching for every one of us. And may I remind you that you can go all the way back to the Old Testament. I can't give you a Bible study right now, but I'm promising you that the blood was applied at the altar and the blood was applied at the laver and the blood was behind the veil and it was applied upon the mercy seat just as when you and I, there was shedding of blood at the, at, at, at the, at the crucifixion of Christ. There was the blood, hallelujah, that, that went into the tomb on his body and there is blood when he comes up out of the grave. I'm telling you blood, blood, blood. We need the blood applied to our lives. The blood is applied at repentance. The blood is applied at baptism. The blood is applied when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And this is why, this is why Jesus answered and said unto Nicodemus, truthfully, truthfully, Nicodemus, this is what I'm saying to you. That except the man or a woman, be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Can I remind us this morning that the new birth is the true, universal starting point for a new life. It is the true and universal starting point for a new life. 24 years ago, we needed a new life. Because we made a life, a mess, excuse me, of the life that we were in control of. The life we were managing. The life that we were, we were charting the course. We made a mess of that life. A new life is only possible through a new birth. And apart from a new birth, there'll never be the true life, 
the new life that Christ envisioned and planned before you ever came into this world. It only happens one way. I, I can take you back. I believe today with everything in me, with everything in me, that the life of Paula Melinda Trentacost does not look, I'm not saying it's perfect, I'm saying it does not look like it looks today in its makeup and landscape. It does not look this way apart from obeying the gospel. It doesn't look like it looks. It doesn't feel like it feels. It doesn't wear like it wears and walk like it walks without the applying of the gospel and obedience thereof to our lives. Without there being a day that I came and dove head first into an altar repenting of every sin that I could possibly remember and think about. The new life doesn't begin without repentance. The restoration that we were so in desperate need of because we had ruined the life that we were in charge of to such a degree. Restoration does not take place until there is first an act of obedience in repentance. And I'm telling you, those of you that are not yet baptized in Jesus' name, I can't, I can't put it in words. I may not can prove it to you, but I'm telling you that on April the 30th in the year 2000, something happened on that day that forever altered the trajectory of my life of my wife's life I'm telling you without obedience to that water baptism in Jesus name wherein we put on Christ where we now took an old life that was a mess and we submerged it in the life the way the truth we literally were submerged in our savior in water baptism who wouldn't want their life to be completely washed clean of every blemish, of every wrinkle, of every mistake, of every blunder, of the guilt, of the shame, of the embarrassment, of the condemnation. Who wouldn't want all of that washed away? And then on that day, July 2nd in the year 2000, when I got up off that altar and began to speak in that heavenly language, never have spoken in a language like that all the days of my, of my life up to that point, begin speaking in that heavenly language. And then from that day forward, completing obedience to the gospel, completing that new birth, it is the beginning of an entire new life, a new journey, and a whole new story. I'm telling you, whoever you are today, you may not be looking for it, but I would ask you this question. What shall a man give? in exchange for his soul. What could you possibly give in exchange for your soul? But I am telling you, if you are in desperate need of a new beginning, if you are tired of banging your head up against the same old wall, if you're disappointed with the way things have turned out, if you're questioning yourself, and even if you're questioning God, I would ask you, have you obeyed the gospel? Jesus said, truthfully, truthfully, I'm saying unto you that except a man or a woman, except, it's a conditional acceptance, except you're born of water and are born of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's like saying, without taking antibiotics, you cannot get rid of the bacteria. If I said to you, without taking antibiotics, you cannot get well, who among us would refuse antibiotics? <laughs> Except we're born again of water and spirit. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. It is the only message ever preached in the entire New Testament when it comes to salvation. And can I tell you this morning that there is no shortage of spiritual penicillin in this house today. And that spiritual penicillin is the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of his spirit. There is no shortage of either in this house today. We just need or just simply need to believe that the dose works and receive the dose, ingest the dose by applying it to our lives through obedience. That is why on that day of Pentecost, from which we get our denominal name. It is when on that day that when those believers, when those gatherers heard this message of salvation, they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, and they said unto Peter and to the other disciples, what shall we do? What 
shall we do? It was the question of all ages. It was the question of all mankind for centuries. What shall we do? Understanding our fate. And Peter stood up that day, just as sure as Paul was before the church of Galatia. And he said unto them, repent and be baptized Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And can I tell us today, we may not understand it all yet. We may not be able to reconcile it all in our minds and emotions quite yet. But I will tell you in the fear of God that sincere obedience often precedes deeper revelation. They gladly received the word that was being preached to them on that day because obedience often precedes deeper revelation. Can I tell you, we don't need to understand everything. Me and Melinda did not understand everything. We were not biblical scholars. We had not become theologians. We had not gone to Bible school. We had not proved it out 14 times over. We simply obeyed because we gladly received what we saw in the word of the living God. And so I have another question this morning. I'm full of questions. If you and I today, if we were in possession of the cure for cancer, I ask you this question, would you conceal it? What if Alexander or Louis Pasteur the French doctor, what if they had concealed their discoveries? If you and I had the cure for cancer and it was home in a medical bag or a briefcase, would we for a moment think to conceal it? Or would we, on the contrary, go home, load up, and run out as fast as as we humanly could do, and getting in contact with every and anyone, starting with our very own loved ones, family, friends, neighbors, would we not run out, and as we had freely received, would we have freely given of this remedy, and more than a remedy, this cure, if we were in possession of it? I ask that question to us as a church, because again, I'm letting you and I understand do we realize, and I don't know that we always do, do we realize what we are in possession of? This is not a religion. This is not a denomination. We're not right or wrong because the sign says Pentecostal. We're not right or wrong because grandma lived this and great grandpa lived this and an auntie planted church. We're not right because of that. It is the word of God, the gospel of our salvation. It's right because it is the salvation message of Jesus Christ to this world. The apostles were charged to proclaim it. He said, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. Did they go out in 12 different directions with 12 different variations and preach 12 different versions of what they thought that they heard him say? No, no, no. Paul was so careful to check himself and to make sure that he had it right and nailed it down and said, if even an angel comes from heaven and tells you anything different, he said, let him be a curse because the gospel that I preach to you is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's immutable. It's unchanging changeable and they were charged to proclaim it and not just proclaim it they were charged to demonstrate it everywhere that they went he said to them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature when I look at the message I stand in the fear of God and with every fiber of my being backed by his word it is the message, it is the only message given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. I ask again, do we believe that? Do we believe that? Because if we believe that, 
We look, at, we look at these men that believe that. These were men that understood the message. Therefore, the mission was absolutely imperative. Men, the Bible says, that hazarded their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Men who put their lives in danger every single day. Paul said, I am in jeopardy every hour for the preaching of the gospel. If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, there is no way all the perils that pounded on Paul's life, there is no way he could not quit. Why wouldn't he quit? There was only one reason. He understood he had the only life-saving message and he had to endure the mission until his mission was over and God was ready to take him. He would never have suffered and endured all that he went through if he didn't believe that it was the only saving message. These men, prison cells, couldn't silence their mission. King's courts did not intimidate their mission. They were unashamed before princes and rulers and governors. Beatings were not a big enough barrier to prevent these believers from running with their mission. Without a second thought, they returned to the scenes of crime. They returned to the scene of the crime. The crimes, not that they committed, but the crimes that were committed against them, having been stoned for the preaching of this message. And they turned around, got their, got their footing, got their bearings back, and went right back to those cities where they were stoned and returned to the scene of the crime and opened up their mouths and their hearts and began to proclaim the gospel. And shame on me if I can't go into a grocery store. Shame on me if I can't talk to my neighbor. Shame on me if I can't share what God's done in my life with a co-worker or a family member. Persecution wasn't powerful enough to slow them down. These men because of the message the Bible says that they completed the mission and so doing they turned their world upside down. They turned their world upside down. Why? Why did they do that? And I think and in part, this is what we've lost. This is what we in part have lost sight of. Number one, the message. Again, I, I told you a few weeks ago. It starts out, it's the gospel. Then Paul talks about it being our gospel. Him and the other apostles, the other disciples, it's our gospel. Then if you read through the epistles, he gets down to the point. He says, it's my gospel. And then he turns around and he says to the believers of Ephesus, it's your gospel. I ask you this morning, in the fear of God, is it your gospel? Is it your gospel? Like the girl in Columbine in that bathroom, when her life was on the line and she was being threatened to denounce Christ. And she would not yield and lost her life. Because she would not denounce the God she believed in. I ask you, is this your gospel? Do you fully and sincerely believe that except you're born again of water and spirit, except you repent and are baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, that there is no salvation or entrance into the kingdom of God? Is that your belief? Because I am telling you in the fear of God, that's the message. It's not my message. It's not this church's message. This is the message of the dispensation of grace. That's the grace-filled message. Because of the mercies of God. But watch what Paul says. Knowing therefore, and this is what I know that we, I don't think we know, as we should, including me. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord that we persuade men. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, Paul said, we persuade. These were men that knew the Lord. These were men that loved God. These were men that God loved. But he said, we understand there's coming a day. It's not right now. We're in the dispensation of grace. But there's coming a day. He said, we know that God is not always going to be in the posture that God is in right now. This is the dispensation of grace. This is the times of the Gentiles. People like you and me, not natural born Jews that are not even supposed to be grafted in. This is our time. But the door is going to close to the Gentiles. And he said, we understand that our time is limited. And we know there's another side to God that people don't fully understand. But knowing this, we must go out with this message. And we must complete the mission. He said, we persuade men. I want to ask us this morning, are we persuaded? Church, this is not a message 
to make you feel poorly. This is a message to make sure and to reinforce that you know what you believe and why. And, and, and if we have the message, then how can we abort the mission? How can we abort the mission? We've got the message. Jude would say it like this. And understand that Jesus had rejectors. I'm not saying everyone's going to embrace what, what message we're proclaiming or sharing in love. Jesus had people that turned their nose and turned their backs. But Jude said, of some, have compassion. Have compassion on all men. Don't use this as a spiritual or religious whip to prove yourself right. Have compassion, making a difference. And he said, others save with fear, not for fear of them, but fear of what is awaiting if they don't obey the gospel and pull them out of the flames, pull them out of the fire. And I'm asking this morning, I want to be, I want to be that guy. I want to be that one that is willing to persuade, that is willing to have compassion, but that is also willing to go into the flames and pull them out of the fire because we understand what awaits. Now they can resist, they can, they can fight against, but we have to make sure as he sent them into those towns that were at least preaching the gospel in love, declaring what God has done for them because he so loved them. And this is why. See, I, I think we miss this again in our understanding of the, of the message. We, we miss that this is part of the why that reason why we receive the power of the Holy Ghost. We, we, we receive that resurrection power to live an overcoming life. But we also have the Holy Ghost. God is not calling us to fulfill a mission that we don't have the power or ability to fulfill. He, he said, no, after that, once you get the Holy Ghost, after that you get the Holy Ghost, the power of God is going to come upon you. What's that power for? That power is not to brag. That power is not to boast. That power is, is not to, to pat ourselves on the back. That power is to be a witness of what? The message. The message, not to condemn other people, but to lead them, lead them as I come to a close, to the great physician who could diagnose more accurately than any doctor and can cure them, can cure them. You see, the message without the mission is benign, but it is the mission is what creates its malignancy. It's the mission that allows for the spreading of of the gospel, the good news. So two, two phases to this morning's altar call. Two phases. The first, the first is, if you have not yet fully obeyed the gospel, this altar, this day, why wait another, why wait another day? Why wait another hour? Oh, goodness. To what point must we hang on before we come to that place of surrender? I'm telling someone in love and in the fear of God, you don't have to live another week like you've been living. I'm telling you, I know you may think, well, that's just ridiculous, Pastor. And it's not going to change. You don't know what I'm facing. And you don't understand what I'm feeling and going through. I'm telling you, why wait? Why go through another week without first finding a place in the altar of God and pouring your heart out and asking Him to rescue you? I know it's awkward, but we're fully prepared for you. This is not a pitch. This is not a gimmick. I'm just telling you everything you could possibly need to be baptized into the only saving name, Jesus Christ, this morning. We have it. We have towels. We have robes. We have toiletries, hair dryers. We've got mousse. We've got gel. You can come out looking like a, a superstar if you want in just a few minutes. But I'm telling you, why would you not? Why would you not want to submerge your life in all that it contains and consists of? Why would you not want to be fully submerged in Christ and put him on? How could that ever be wrong? being baptized into Jesus' name. And if you have not yet received the baptism of His Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, applying the gospel to your life so that you know that you've got power to overcome and power that when that trumpet sounds, you can depart from this earth with a confidence knowing that whenever the day and hour may be or the return of Christ of which no man knows the day or the hour, that we are ready to meet him and to spend eternity with him. Why would we ever want to deny ourselves of that? Why would I go home and have a, a bottle of antibiotics and have a paper cut and die because of it? Die because of a paper cut. 
when I have a bottle full of antibiotics in my medicine chest at home. We have the scriptures, the word of the living God. If you have not yet obeyed the gospel, it doesn't mean you're, you're now right and they're wrong or vice versa. It's simply obedience or a heart that is responding to the mercy of God. That is our first response. And we're ready. I would ask you, those of you that are in that category, come to, to my left and your right. But then there are others of us. We're sure. We're emboldened. We're passionate. But we deal with fear. We deal with intimidation. We deal with other distractions that keep us from fulfilling the mission. And I am praying, I, I want to be in this category today. God, when you open doors like you opened for the Apostle Paul, he said, oh, at those thresholds, there are going to be many adversaries. But God, this is why you planted a church in Mandeville. He didn't plant us here to just be one of 31 flavors. He didn't plant us here to compete and see if we can outdo on social media or outdo with technology or giving or money or building or construction, see if we can outdo the church down the street. That is not why God put us here. But I believe with everything in me, not in preeminence, but in humility, I believe we have the message of the New Testament. And we have a responsibility. See, the devil has caused us to believe that it's only a certain gifted few that can teach Bible study. The devil would have us believe that, that that's just for a rare few. And he would keep us so distracted and we would deflect and think that that's not my responsibility. But he turned around and he said, no, no, no. I'm commanding you. I'm commanding you to receive the message, to be born again. And he said, I'm commanding you to go with it. And I think that's the part that the church, not this church, the church is missing. And I don't want to just teach you that you've got to obey the gospel without helping you understand that there's equal responsibility for you and I both to run with the message. It's a command. I command you, therefore, to go. But this is the beautiful promise. We don't, we don't have to fulfill the mission on our own. The mission isn't just left up to us. He said, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So when we go to run with the message... And we go to fulfill the, mess, the, miss, the mission. He said, I'm with you. I'm with you. Church, this is why we exist. This is why we've been given this, this privileged message. But we must fulfill the mission that the message then has caused us to understand. Praise God. Can we stand this morning? I don't want to be afraid. I'm praying for utterance. I'm praying, God, open up those doors in my life. God, when those doors open, give me a divine unction. Get, let there be an anointed unction. Put the words in my mouth. Give me the boldness. Paul and the other, they were not ashamed before kings and princes and people of reputation. No, no, no. With humility, they just understood, I've got the message. I've got the message. And I'm on a mission. Church, we must be a people on a mission. We must be a people on a mission because it does us no good to simply hoard the message when there is a lost and dying world that can be saved with just a few drops of spiritual penicillin. I want to run with it. I want to run with it. I want to fulfill the command of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. If you feel that way, I would ask you to come to this altar today. This has been burning on my heart for weeks, perhaps over a month. We've got the message. I'm sure about it. The word is sure about it. It's the mission. It's the mission that we've got to get right. It's the mission that we've got to get, we've got to get active and busy carrying out. And if you're here today, let today be the beginning of a new day for you. Let today be the beginning of a whole new life for you. It's a new beginning. It's a new beginning. It's a new beginning. Let us begin to pray. Some repenting, some contemplating, some understanding that the mercy of God is reaching for you. And please, please understand, if, you're, if you've attended here for any amount of time, you know this. This is not about changing your religion. What I preached to you today out of the Bible was not about you changing your religious persuasion, was not about saying we're right and everyone else is wrong. It's about your soul. It's about your soul. It's not about becoming Pentecostal. 
Paul didn't mention anything about becoming Pentecostal. He talked about being a Christ follower. Hallelujah. Come on, let's lift our voices. I know that I didn't preach this just to myself. And I know, I know, I know. I know that we may not all be living in the same realm of revelation, but at least receive the word and let God deal with you. Let God talk to you. I pray that you can feel my sincerity and the genuineness of my heart, my spirit, my love. And I'm telling you that there's a new life. There's a new life. Hallelujah. There's a new beginning. If you want to be water baptized, in Jesus' name, you have to repent first. There needs to be true repentance. There's a water that awaits. There's a spirit that wants to fill you up to the brim and overflowing. And then we have the message, men of God, women of God, if we believe we've got it, what are we doing with it? Oh, goodness, we know, we know people with cancer. We would call them up. We would go to them. We wouldn't ask and wait for an invitation or a good, a good time or a right time. We would kick on, kick on their front door and say, hey, i got something that can help you. Hallelujah. God, give us the courage. Give us the boldness. Give us the love to reach into a lost and dying world with the only saving grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Sometimes you got to get desperate. Sometimes, sometimes there's got to be a desperation. Sometimes we can, we can overweight the right time. Sometimes we can, we can overthink the right decision. Let your heart talk to you today. Let your heart talk to you today. The Word of God, let it speak to you today. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah.